from inside the warehouse at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. It is the Masson All Access Podcast. Bo Mancana, Brendan Mortensen here with you. We are rejoined by our free agency bracket. If you're watching live on YouTube and Facebook, by the way, we go live on YouTube and Facebook with all these videos. So watch live if you can, uh, because Brendan, a couple weeks ago, we put out this free agency bracket. We determined a final four and a winner of this free agency bracket. And boy, we have had a crazy 72 hour period where I didn't think all these names were going to be coming off the board in such a quick manner, but this list of players available has dwindled quite a lot. It has, but honestly, the bracket is looking okay at this point. Our entire Elite Four is... Elite Eight? Uh, yeah, excuse me. Our, our final entire four. Final Four there we go. is still alive. Five of our Elite Eight are still alive. I, I got the Final Four and Elite Eight. And I, I just mushed them together. Not a college I was gonna basketball say both. fan, huh? Apparently not. So that I think that's pretty good. Five of the Elite Eight still alive. All of the Final Four... Yeah. That's pretty good. So we have in the Elite Eight, Sandy Leon, he is gone. Yep. Robinson Chirinos is still out there. Matt Harvey is still out there. John Gray has gone. Got a huge deal. Way bigger than I think either of us thought he was going to sign with the Texas Rangers, right? Yep. And they think that they can turn a... what, four years, 50-something million? Which, by the way, I'll just go on the record... I don't know if that's going to work. A hundred <laughs> no. two lost that's... team signing just four guys for like a billion dollars doesn't seem like a sustainable plan to me. No, they put half a billion dollars into their middle infield. Yeah. One of which was a thirty-one-year-old Marcus Semyon that they gave seven years to. Yeah, and I'm I'm not yeah. gonna I'm not gonna knock the team for going out there and getting good players because these are all good players. But how many times do we see it in baseball, in football, in basketball? You you can't sp- maybe you can in basketball. You can't spend your way into competitiveness. I don't understand this. It just screams like somebody is gonna post the meme at the end of the year. It's just like the Rangers spent this amount of money for. 70 wins. You just it screams that meme. Yeah, I mean, you just can't... You, you can build on a good core with free agents. I, d- I don't know if you can build a team out of free agents. Well, they're banking on the prospects coming up and being very good very soon, and I don't know if they have enough elite prospects yeah, to make that happen as quickly as they think. They We haven't seen them be good at the major league level yet, so no. you just don't... Anyway, uh, <laughs> we have Marwin Gonzalez is still in there. Larry Garcia has signed, I believe, back with the White Sox. Jose Iglesias is still out there, and Andrelton Simmons is still out there. So, we still got some some guys on there. And I think that speaks to how we picked our list. We did it well. We didn't go for necessarily the huge names like a Corey Seager or, you know, some of the other guys that signed. But, uh, you know, we, we picked guys that we thought were realistic for the Orioles to sign. And yeah. that's why they're still there. The list was so good, in fact, that none of these middle infield third baseman candidates uh, were Ruben and Odor. Yes, glad you mentioned him, because we're going to be spending a lot of time on our podcast today talking about Rube Neto Dorr, who was the first free agent acquisition by the Orioles on a major league deal this offseason. We're also going to be talking about the non-tender deadline yesterday and what the Orioles chose to do with their six arbitration-eligible players. And then CNL Perez, a new name on the Orioles' 40-man roster that we're going to be touching on, as well as some changes in the Orioles' farm system at the managerial level. We'll close out the podcast with that. But Brendan... Well, and we're going to talk about the Cedric Mullins, John Means trade rumor business. Yes. The ridiculousness about of that. that. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. So, as such, last week we teased a create a trade game, and we picked teams out of a jar that we were going to create trades with. We ended up concocting those trades, but you're going to have to wait a week to hear them because so much news came out in the past week that we have to cover it all, and we're not going to be able to fit it into a, an hour-long episode. So we will do the create a trade game a week from now. Uh, but in the meantime... Major League Baseball is just going crazy with the amount of money that is being thrown out right now because the CBA expires at midnight, and that means we're likely headed towards a lockout, the duration of which nobody knows. So teams are trying to get these deals done now so that by the time the lockout is over and the freeze on transactions is over in January, February, we're not sure when, they will mostly have their roster set, and they will 
maybe just have to add a couple guys here and there. But the benefit of doing it now means that you will carry these guys throughout the winter. So it is, in essence, sort of like a deadline to sign big-time free agents. Yeah, which has been fun. If yeah. you read Steve Molesky's great article on MassInSports.com, he was talking about how exciting the last few days have been with how many of these big free agents have signed big money deals and they've all happened within a, a very short time frame here. And Steve threw out the idea of potentially having a free agency deadline at some point so we get a little more excitement during the MLB offseason. Seems like a fun idea. The last 48 hours have been really fun with all the free agents that have been signing huge contracts. So could be a good idea. And the Orioles get themselves into the mix as well, albeit with a much smaller signing than some of the $325 million or so that's being thrown out to the Corey Seegers of the world. Orioles get themselves Rug Ned Odor, 27-year-old second baseman, has versatility to play in other positions. And Brendan, I think that this was a guy that the Orioles were not expecting to be out there, but when the uh, Yankees released him not long ago, I think they decided, they looked at the amount of money that was due to him from the Rangers and the Yankees and said, we can get this guy to a minimum MLB salary and we believe that he can add some depth to our infield. Yeah, Odor is in an interesting spot because he doesn't really need to sign a big contract anywhere to be making a lot of money this season because he is already getting paid so much money from the Rangers and a little bit of money from the Yankees who took on part of that deal from Texas. So he doesn't really need to sign for all that much with Baltimore to still be making a lot of money during the 2022 season. And with Baltimore probably more so than a lot of other teams that he would have looked at. I think he gets a chance to start on opening day. He definitely would not have started with the Yankees. At least I don't think so, assuming they're going to make some bigger free agent splashes to shore up that middle infield. And I don't know how many teams out there would probably want to start Rugnet Odor at this point, given how the last few seasons have gone for him. But in seasons like 2019, he still flashed enough where I think he is an upgrade in the infield for the Orioles at this point. Yeah, he's due about $12.3 million. 11.76 of that will be paid by the Rangers this year, and the Yankees will pick up the rest, which means the Orioles are going to sign him to an additional major league deal, which is worth the minimum, and we don't know how much that's going to be because the collective bargaining agreement will set the minimum salary. But this deal was first reported by Dan Connolly of The Athletic last night. He also reported the terms of the deal. So essentially, you're getting, as opposed to somebody like a Cesar Hernandez, who we had in this bracket, who went and signed with the Nationals on a one-year, $4 million deal, Cesar Hernandez doesn't have money that he is expecting from a previous contract. Right. He doesn't have 13 million that he's just waiting to put in his bank because it's due to him no matter what. So he's going to try to drive up his price as well he should because he is a free agent and you get so few opportunities at this. However, Rugnet Odor looked at all his opportunities and money money is a factor in any decision, but I tend to think money was less of a factor here. And so it worked out for both player and team to say the Orioles have an opening at second base. They can give him playing time. And he still fits that bill of potentially being a trade piece if he plays well enough and he could find himself on a playoff contender come August and September. Yeah, and it's not like he was going to get a huge contract somewhere else anyway. Right, His 2021 true. stats were not fantastic he hit 202 he had 15 homers just an 83 wrc plus so he did runs created plus yeah, yeah there you go so he's not fantastic offensively and he's slightly below average defensively at second base but paul here is, is something that jumped out to me that i think the orioles might have been looking at if i had to put my money on it right now i think rugnet odor is your opening day third baseman for the Baltimore Orioles. He has played second base throughout his career. That's all he was at Texas. But with the Yankees last year, he got his first kind of taste of third base. He only played a little over 30 games there, but he actually had much better defensive metrics at third base. Yes, in a smaller sample size, but he had better defensive metrics at third than he had at second. And I think right now for the Orioles, I would argue that third base is probably a bigger need at this point than second. I mean, you've got Kelvin Gutierrez there. It's basically, would you rather start Kelvin Gutierrez or Ramon Arias at third, or would you rather start a Ramon Arias, Jamai Jones kind of platoon thing at second? So I think Odor could start at third. 
I think his versatility is what attracted the Orioles to right. him. The, his theoretical versatility, because you mentioned that very small sample size. He didn't play third base at the professional level until last year. It, it, when he spent those first seven seasons with the Texas Rangers, he was exclusively a second baseman, and it was only out of need last year by the Yankees that he was stuck at third. But I think the ability to bounce him around the infield is what attracts him to the Orioles, because I, to me, it's kind of a wash. When you look at second base and third base, in particular with the Orioles, to me, shortstop is, right now, I think Jorge Mateo's job, unless the Orioles find an upgrade in the free agent market. I think right. they're comfortable starting him on opening day at shortstop and giving him that playing time. I think they're far less comfortable with both Jemai Jones at second and with Kelvin Gutierrez at third. And Ramon Arias is a nice piece, but I don't know if he's an opening day position player at either of those spots. So to me, I think it's the they signed him knowing that they have the ability to move him around. It's not like the Freddie Galvis signing a year ago where they signed him to be their opening day shortstop. They needed depth. We talked about it at the beginning of the offseason for that infield, depth pieces. So him not being strictly a second baseman or not being strictly a third baseman, I think allows the Orioles to potentially make another upgrade in free agency in the infield because they can then fill that spot with another versatile guy or a definitive second baseman, whatever. It opens up more doors by getting somebody who is versatile. Right, and the way I look at it, I think third base has a larger opportunity for Rugnet Odor than second base does because I think at second base, at least in my opinion, I think you're a little bit more comfortable with Jemai Jones, Ramon Arias, that combination at second than you are with Kelvin Gutierrez and maybe Ramon Arias if you want to stretch him to third over there. I think the options at the hot corner were more limited. I, I think, yes, in theory, but I think you and I would be much more comfortable playing Jemai Jones than Brandon Hyde showed he was at the end of the 2021 season. Sure, but I think Arias is also more comfortable at second than sure. he is at third. I'm also not positive that Arias is going to make it through this offseason with the Orioles because I'm, we were looking at that trade game. I think he could make sense as a trade candidate, in theory. He could. However, I, I think the Orioles view him more as a depth piece slash maybe trade piece down the line than a long-term answer. And I don't know if they are fully comfortable handing the keys to second base to Jemai Jones just yet. Um, and I think that he is probably farther away, further away than they maybe would think that he would be at this point. Probably. I, I think the way that I see it right now is... Ideally, if Jemai Jones has a good offseason and you're hoping that as a better prospect than somebody like Ramona Rios, somebody with a lot of potential, Jemai Jones would take the keys to that second base job at some point. And you're hoping that if he starts their opening day, looks good, that's just his job. Right. So I think ideally, at least the way I see it right now, I would have Jemai Jones at second, Jorge Mateo at short and Rugnet Odor at third with Ramon Arias being able to plug and play in any of those positions wherever you need him to go. Right. With probably second base being the most likely option, given the fact that Jemai Jones, out of those three, is probably the least likely to take command of a job and be an everyday starter. And of course, everything could change by midseason 2022 if Jordan Westberg and Gunnar Henderson are prepared to make the leap up to the big leagues. Right. And you never know with Ryland Bannon if he gets off to a hot start in 2022 and earns himself a promotion. I think in terms of the lineup, though, I think Brandon Hyde will like having him there, not because he is especially productive in the lineup, but he is a lefty bat that breaks up the likes of Trey Mancini, Ryan Mountcastle, Austin Hayes, Jorge Mateo, who are all righties. And I think that that adds a little bit of something Anthony Santander is, of course, a switch hitter. We don't know how long he is going to, if he's going to make it through this offseason with the Orioles. They did tender him a contract and came to terms on an agreement, but could be a trade piece as well. So I think he makes sense as a lefty bat in there as well, in addition to that versatility. And a year ago, we were looking at Yolmer Sanchez, who was a waiver claim, and already fitting him into different positions in that infield. And then he ended up not being with the team by opening day. So... I think that everything is in flux. However, I would say Rugnet Odor is probably likely to make it at the very least to spring training with the Orioles. I, I don't agree. I don't see them dropping him at this point because he's not a waiver claim. He's a free agent addition. 
So even though he's making the minimum salary, he's still on a major league deal. I tend to, I, I like his chances to make this opening day roster. Yeah, I do as well. And Odor still provides a power threat. He right. is, he doesn't have a great average. He doesn't have a great on base percentage. He is a pretty much a home run or strikeout hitter with the obvious not great caveat of the fact that he does not walk a lot. Yeah. Because a lot of guys who are homer or strikeout are also walking at a decent clip, and that's still what makes them... Val- like a guy like Joey Gallo hits a ton of home runs and strikes out a lot, but he is also towards the top of the majors in walks. Ruknin Odor, his plate discipline has pretty much been the thing that has hurt him throughout his career because he just does not walk a lot. But he does have three seasons of 30-plus homers, which could still give you a decent power bat in the middle of the Orioles lineup if he's hitting fifth or sixth, somewhere around there. Yeah, I think he is going to mean much a much different thing to this Orioles team than he meant to the Yankees last year. Yes. Like, as on the Yankees last year, he was viewed probably negatively, I would think, by the Yankees fan base because he was a April trade to fill in desperately in place of some injured guys, and they were a team that was fighting in a very competitive AL East to beat out the Rays, and he wasn't getting the job done. That's Those expectations are not going to be there for him in Baltimore. So he doesn't quite fill that role for the Yankees. He didn't fill that role well for them, I would say, as a you know clutch off the bench or spot start at second or third type guy. He didn't, he didn't live up to those expectations because a lot was thrust on him. However, for the Orioles, I think he makes a lot of sense just as a depth piece. I don't know. My question would be is, do you really think he's going to coop you anything back at the trade deadline? And he was traded for two prospects last April by the Rangers to the Yankees, and the Yankees ended up picking up just a, you know about a couple million in his salary. Um, so the Rangers had to eat a ton of his salary after that trade. I don't know if, given the 2021 that he had, where he hit 202 with a 286 on base percentage and just 15 homers, I think he would have to get off, Rugnet Odor would have to get off to a very hot start in 2022 for other teams to perk their ears up and try to trade for him. The only, I think the biggest benefit that comes with Odor as well is that if you are trading for him at the deadline, you don't have to pay him a lot of money because True. the Rangers are still paying so much money to Rugnet Odor that a team picking him up at the deadline does not need to give him that much money. And I mean, look at the Yankees last year. Injuries happen, especially in the last few seasons with COVID and all of these different things that have been knocking players out for an extended period of time. Teams get desperate occasionally and yeah. teams could use somebody like Rugnet Odor, who is by all accounts also very good in the locker room. He's a good veteran presence and he can maybe get 30 home runs in a season. I know he's going to strike out a lot, but 30 home runs is is still pretty good. Yeah, and I, I mean, it, I will say on the other side, to your point, I didn't think Freddie Galvis was going to be traded, especially after he went down with that injury, but he ended up getting sent to the Phillies, albeit for a low-level minor league player, but if the Orioles can recoup some kind of trade value, if they have somebody ready to take Rudnando Doors' spot in the infield by midseason 2022, I think they will jump on a deal like that, assuming oh, he, he makes it through the offseason with them. Uh of course, we can't not mention the uh, incident he had with Jose Bautista. That actually happened, Brendan, the day before my very first day at Masson. Wow. So I came in that, that morning uh, to this very office, and uh, everybody was talking about it. It was the big story in baseball, that insane, insane incident. Heck of a right hook. Yeah. Um, my question for you, Brendan, do you expect the Orioles to make any other free agent additions to their infield on major league deals from now until spring training or until opening day? I don't think so. I think they probably, uh, here's the thing. They could upgrade in the middle infield still. Rugnet Odor does not give you a massive upgrade anywhere in the infield at this point. I think you could probably start him at third base and have Jorge Mateo at short with some combination of Jemai Jones and Ramon Arias. Where I think the Orioles could go is if they just don't have a ton of confidence that, like you said, Jemai Jones just might not lock down that second base job. Jorge Mateo just might not lock down shortstop. And I think it would make sense to bring on one more veteran middle infielder to solidify things a little bit. 
But where that gets tricky is if you still have Arias, Jemai Jones, Jorge Mateo, Odor, Kelvin Gutierrez, bringing in another veteran middle infielder makes that middle infield now very crowded where you are now potentially blocking guys like Jemai Jones and Jorge Mateo from getting playing time. So it's really just how do the Orioles want to balance making sure you are giving enough playing time to Jemai Jones and Jorge Mateo versus having somebody that you're a little more comfortable with in the middle infield. I think at this point last year, you know, the Orioles waited until February before they made their first true free agent addition in the middle infield, and that was Freddie Galvis that they signed to a $1.5 million deal. And we thought at that point that they might be done, and it wasn't until a couple weeks before opening day that they signed Michael Michael Franco to a pretty sure it was close to league minimum deal of about $800,000 two weeks before opening day because he was somebody that they thought they could maybe recoup something from at the deadline. They felt more comfortable with him, and he was cheaper than they might have thought he was going to be at the beginning of the offseason. So I wouldn't, personally, I wouldn't rule out any kind of addition in this middle infield because I think that we saw it last year where they're going to, they may wait it out, we may get close to opening day before they make an addition, but I could very well see Michael Elias jumping on somebody once, assuming there is some kind of lockout and the, the transaction freeze. If that ends mid-February or right before spring training, I think there's going to be another second wave of free agent signings around baseball. And I think some of the guys on this list, on this free agent bracket, are still going to be there. So I think those guys are probably going to want homes they're going to want to know where they're going to move their families. They're going to want to get some guaranteed money. So I could see if Marwin Gonzalez is still out there, if if a Jake Lamb is still out there, the Orioles jumping on that and saying, look, we can get this guy cheap because he's been on the market for so long, and maybe we can get something from him at the deadline. If not, we can cut him in August, September, like we did with Michael Franco uh, in 2021. Yeah, I think if they do bring somebody else on, it makes a lot of sense to bring on somebody with a similar versatility to the guys that you already have, right? Like, I don't know if they are going to sign somebody like Angelton Simmons who is going to come in and only play shortstop for you. I think they'd be much more likely to sign somebody like Jonathan VR, who you could bounce around between second base and third base and maybe even an outfield spot if you wanted to. Just because you have so many guys that are so versatile, you want to be able to keep the ability to move those guys around pretty much wherever you need them to. So I don't know if they're going to bring in a veteran to lock down one position specifically. Yeah. And I think also if it will, it'll, the contract will tell us what they think of these, these guys, you know, they signed Michael Franco to be their opening day third baseman, but they didn't give him a whole lot of money. So they weren't committing a whole lot to him knowing that somebody could take his job. And I think if Rylan Bannon had played well enough in triple a, they probably would have promoted Rylan Bannon and figured out what to do with Michael Franco later. Right. Um, so we can't talk about the addition that they made to the infield without also talking about a subtraction that they made to their infield. Lucius Fox, who a week ago, we spent a good portion of our podcast, Brendan, talking about what he could bring to the Orioles. This 24-year-old, speedy, shortstop, second baseman can play in the outfield from the Bahamas, smart, fun, energetic guy, and now he's gone. They dropped him to waivers yeah. and claimed by the Washington Nationals. I think the Orioles just thought that they could sneak him through waivers. I, I assume is the only that's the only thing that makes sense because what changed in a week from when the Orioles picked him up to when they decided to place him on waivers? I think the what changed was not from his perspective, what they saw from him, because obviously they had him for a week. Right. Uh, I think it's just they wanted to clear out the roster space for uh, Ruth and Odor signing, and they wanted to make sure that they had two open roster spots for the Rule 5 draft. Right. So I don't think it's anything from him. I think he was just the last guy in their list. But I, I don't think it's anything from him, but again, we, we've been over the 40-man roster how many times at this point? But it comes back to the same argument of you place Lucius Fox on waivers and you still have some fringe bullpen arms and some fringe outfielders on the team that are kind of just hanging out on the 40-man right. roster that you're not really sure what to do with, why is the 24-year-old former top prospects middle infielder the one who gets the wave? Yeah, it's, it's pretty clear that when they, by this move, that when they claimed him off waivers a week ago, 
he slotted in as the 40th guy on that 40-man roster. It's not like they claimed him and bumped him up to 35, you know, and then were willing to cut other guys. They claimed him and said we could drop him in a week. And and we said that on last week's podcast that it was similar to Yolmer Sanchez, that Yolmer Sanchez was added at the beginning of the offseason as a waiver claim. And when he was added, Mike Elias said, keep in mind, this is just a waiver claim. It's early in the offseason. Don't read into this like he is our guaranteed opening day second baseman. Everybody ignored that advice because of how long he was on the roster for, and he made it all the way through February, and then he was cut right before opening day. And then I day. drafted him in the Orioles 40-man roster draft. Yes, he did. Thanks, Mike. And then he ended up getting dropped to waivers right before opening day. So yep. with that context in mind, I had the same reading, and I said, you know, it, this could be Yolmer Sanchez 2.0. However, I thought Lucius Fox would make it a little bit more than a week on the 40-man roster. Yeah. It, it, it was a full week. I thought it seemed a little bit more similar to Jorge Mateo, even though Mateo was claimed yeah. in a mid-season thing, but it was the same type of player. I mean, he was a former top prospect. You just needed to give him a chance, all these things, and then there he goes to the Nationals. I, however, I will say that because Jorge Mateo, like we said on last week's podcast, because Jorge Mateo is of a similar mold, there is some overlap there. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot yeah. of overlap. Very similar players, very similar stories. So maybe they said, we already have Jorge Mateo, and we think he's a better version of... Lucius Fox, let's just drop him to waivers. Yeah, and Lucius Fox probably doesn't have the versatility to play third base at the major league level at this point. Rugnet Odor, who was just added to the 40-man roster, has the versatility to play third base, looked pretty good with the Yankees last year. Maybe that's what went into the decision. Well, and Lucius Fox is not a major league player yet. Right. Whereas Rugnet Odor is, you don't know how good of a major league player he's going to be in 2022. He's a major league player. But he has experience at the major league level. Hey, right. he at one point got a $46 million contract extension from the Rangers. So, and he's still only, the weird thing is he he doesn't turn 28 until the beginning of February. Yeah, he's been around for a while. Which it feels like he has been, yeah, been around for way longer than that. He should be at least 30, but no, he's still pretty young. So that's as old as Kelvin Gutierrez is, I believe. I believe Kelvin Gutierrez turns 28 next season. So, put into context the Orioles are still getting somebody who is fairly young and if he can recapture some of what we saw in his early years at Texas in Texas I think that the Orioles could still have a pretty good player on their hands yeah if he hits 30 home runs like he did in 2019 <laughs> and he's, take that. he's a good career hitter at Oreo Park at Camden Yards he is a 286 294 career hitter at Camden Yards with an 815 OPS in 24 games yeah yeah another subtraction from that infield we just mentioned Lucius Fox Richie Martin yeah, outrighted to triple A. I don't think Richie Martin was going to play into the Orioles middle infield conversation when we've talked about guys who were going to get significant playing time. Richie Martin was not really in that discussion. So this move doesn't come as as all that much of a surprise. Yeah, another guy who's 27 years old, but on the outside looking in. It's a shame because injuries have put him so far behind other guys who at one point he was ahead of. At one point, as the number one overall pick in the Rule 5 draft, the Orioles clearly had something invested in him. They they kept him for the whole year when they didn't have to. They could have sent him back during his uh, struggling rookie season. And so they had a lot invested in him. Um, but clearly, he just did not... He, he didn't have anything ahead of the, the other guys on this list, you know? Yeah, he's not going to play over yeah. the younger guys like Jemai Jones and Jorge Mateo. He's not going to play over Ramon Arias, who is, I think, around the same age as well and has just outplayed Richie Martin when giving, given similar opportunities at the major league level. So I just don't see where he would have gotten playing time with the Orioles at all, unless, right. again, maybe he tried to shift over to third base and got some more versatility there. That's really the only scenario I saw him getting any playing time. Yeah. Let's talk about the non-tender deadline because the Orioles had six arbitration eligible players going into yesterday. And of course, it was just the deadline for them to tender contracts. They didn't have to agree to deals, but just to decide on who they wanted to keep and who they wanted to non-tender. And the Orioles ended up keeping all six guys. They come to agreements with three of them and they tender contracts to the other three, Brandon. Yeah, Buster only really tried to rile up Orioles Twitter yesterday with tweeting about the interesting decision that they had about Trey Mancini and whether they were going to tender him a contract. 
it would have been incredibly surprising if they non-tendered Trey Mancini. You and I were not surprised at all that they tendered him a deal, but Orioles Twitter was riled up about it. Well, yeah, anytime you get close to a deadline like this, you start to get worried. Right. <laughs> and I think it's similar to what we saw a year ago with Jose Iglesias, where the Orioles waited until the very last hour before picking up his one-year option for $3.5 million. They waited until right before the deadline before they did it. But Michael Elias has said before, that's just a matter of if you have the time, use it. There's no reason to force yourself to make a mistake by picking up an option that ends up looking bad right before the deadline. You know, right. Use the time that is afforded to you. So everybody can relax about Trey Mancini. He got tendered a contract. They'll come to an agreement at some point, I would guess. Uh, the guys who did agree to deals, Anthony Santander, Jorge Lopez, and Paul Fry. Santander, the biggest one there, with $3.15 million. He was projected to get 3.7, according to MLB trade rumors. To me, that made too much sense. It, it's still $3.15 million for a switch-hitting, power-hitting outfielder, corner outfielder, despite his flaws in terms of injuries and you know, inconsistent play, $3.15 million for a, a 27-year-old right fielder made too much sense. Yeah, and $3.7 million in arbitration, if that's what he ended up getting, that would have made sense as well. Yeah. Anything under, you know, the $4 million mark makes a ton of sense for Anthony Santander, and it's nice that the Orioles reached the agreement and didn't have to go through the arbitration process. Did the same thing with Paul Fry. I know Paul Fry struggled at the end of last year, but... 850000 for somebody who was lights out at the beginning of 2021, was considered one of the best left-handed relievers in the American League at that point. Just to see if he can be more consistent and regain what he had at the beginning of last year, well worth 850000 for a year. And for Jorge Lopez, 1.5 was he projected to, to make, and he ended up getting exactly that, $1.5 million dollars was what they came to the agreement with. A little bit pricier, but it's worth seeing if he can solidify himself in the bullpen. Because if he can, that's a valuable bullpen piece with great stuff who, worst comes to worst, can make a spot start here or there. Yeah, and again, this is not $1.5 million for Jorge Lopez, the starting pitcher. This is $1.5 million for Jorge Lopez, the bullpen arm that Mike Elias and Brandon Hyde have both seemed to be pretty excited about what he showed in a limited time last year because the stuff is really good and it translated pretty well to the bullpen in a small sample size. Yeah, so those three guys came to agreements. You mentioned Trey Mancini has been tendered a contract, so has John Means, and so has Tanner Scott. The only question there was maybe if the Orioles would non-tender Tanner Scott, but he was only projected to make about $1 million and... By all intents and purposes, he had a better year than Paul Fry did, who got 850000 Still, he's younger than Paul Fry, a lefty with obviously a great fastball. For what you're paying him, that's very well worth the risk. Yeah, he's too young, and he's flashed too much potential. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense for the Orioles to let him go at any point soon unless it's in a trade where you are getting something back. Yeah. He, he's flashed too much potential. All right, one guy that the Orioles claimed and added to their 40-man roster last week before the non-tender deadline. That would be left-handed pitcher CNL Perez, 25 years old. They got him from the Cincinnati Reds. Not a great track record at the big league level. Very good in the minor leagues. He has a Houston connection, which goes back to Michael Elias, obviously. A career 604 ERA in 50 and two thirds innings at the big league level across four different seasons with the Astros and the Reds. Uh, exclusively a reliever, but he is a very good minor league track record. And for a guy who's 25 years old, it seems like there might be something left to discover with him. Yeah, he's a good stuff guy. He had a 638 ERA last year, but the expected ERA was down at 442 which is still not fantastic, but that's a lot better than 638. Lefties hit just 179 off of him last year, and the stuff is clearly good. He had a 22.5% strikeout rate at the majors last year, but the command is the biggest issue there probably. He had an 18% walk rate last year, uh, which is not good. So if you can get that command under control a little bit, 
the stuff is good enough to have a high strikeout rate, and maybe he can be a valuable piece of the bullpen, and it never hurts to have a young lefty. Yeah, righties hit 264 against him in his big league career, but lefties hit just 179 against him. So matchup lefty, and I think if if uh, Paul Fry is not a part of this bullpen, I think that he could fill that spot as well. Yeah, you know, it, you, solid lefty strikeout guy. He seems to have similar issues to Tanner Scott, where the right. stuff is good, but the command is not. And if you can figure out the command a little bit, the stuff is there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so he adds a piece to that bullpen, potentially, assuming he makes it through the offseason with the team. No guarantee. Right. But the Orioles' 40-man roster now is set at 38 after all the moves. So you're, you've got 38 guys. You've got two open spots. And to me, I don't know when this Rule 5 draft is going to happen. It was supposed to happen, what, a week from... Two weeks from Thursday, two weeks from tomorrow, I believe, as producer Bobby Blanco tells us. Yeah. So that may be in February it or might March. Be in a long time. Uh, it may come at some point down the line, but we assume there's still going to be a Rule 5 draft in the new collective bargaining agreement. Uh, so the Orioles, by staying at 38 right now, they're probably not going to make any more moves before the CBA expires at midnight, which means they have two open spots just like we predicted from the very beginning. How they got there, we did not get right at all. But we predicted that the Orioles would leave themselves two open spots to take two players in the Rule 5 draft. Yeah, and I can't imagine that Mike Elias is going to waver from that 38 number, no pun intended. I think if we do see another addition before midnight, which seems unlikely, it will probably also come with somebody getting DFA'd or waived. Right. Yeah, it, it would probably... they. I don't know when the deadline is. Yeah, like you said. So we'll see. Uh, but they're at 38 for right now. Brendan, should we talk about Cedric Mullins and John Means? I think we should. We have run through so many topics on this podcast. But this one... I'll put this on the ooh. D for you. Go ahead and swing. This one <laughs> was interesting. There, uh, there was a report that came out that Mike Elias was listening to calls about John Means and Cedric Mullins. At no point in that report did it say that Mike Elias was picking up the phone and asking other general managers if they had any interest in Cedric Mullins or John Means because, of course, probably 29 other teams in Major League Baseball would say, yes, absolutely, we have interest in your all-star 26-year-old center fielder. But Mike Elias was simply listening to the calls about Cedric Mullins. I'm going to use Mullins as the primary example here. Sure. Because, of course, teams are going to call the rebuilding Baltimore Orioles about a very good player because the Orioles have had a track record over the last few years of trading good players because they are in a rebuild. However, I understand the reaction that trading Cedric Mullins would be ridiculous, that it would be a, an incredibly foolish move to trade somebody who looks like a centerpiece of this team. It would be way more foolish to not at least listen to the offers that are being made for Cedric Mullins. Say, for example, the Seattle Mariners call Mike Elias and say, hey, we're in a win-now mode. We just signed Robbie Ray. We're going all in this year. We will offer you Julio Rodriguez, the number two prospect in all of baseball who is more than likely going to be a superstar. Julio Rodriguez for Cedric Mullins. You have to listen to a trade proposal like that. You're not going to trade him, but there at least is going to be the possibility that somebody blows you away with an offer and it wouldn't make sense not to listen to it. At this point, to me, this is how I look at it. Cedric Mullins is not the best player in baseball. John Means is not the best pitcher in baseball. Therefore, there are other players and pitchers that are ahead of them. Not many, but there are players and pitchers that are ahead of those two guys. Therefore, you have to listen. Yeah. Because in theory, one of the players or pitchers who is better than Cedric Mullins and John Means could be offered in the deal. You know how many untouchable players are in Major League Baseball? You can count them on one hand. Mike well, Trout. I would say Mike Trout. Shohei Otani. Shohei Vlad Jr. I would say maybe Ronald Acuna. Acuna. Maybe Juan Soto. Yeah, well, Juan Soto, if the Nationals don't decide that they need to get something before he hits free agency. You could, you could argue Jacob deGrom... <laughs> end of list end of list Max Scherzer one of the greatest pitchers of this era just got traded a few months ago guys get traded and I don't think it's crazy for the Orioles to be listening 
And it's it, like you said, it's not like they're picking up the phone and calling other teams. There are so few untouchable players in baseball, and especially on a team that just lost 110 games, there are especially no untouchable players, as there should not be. Untouchable should only apply to very few guys. Mookie Betts got traded up by the Red Sox to the Dodgers, what, 18 months ago? And yeah. then the Red Sox ended up making the playoffs and making it uh, to the ALCS? Yeah, Mookie Betts, who at the time was coming off of an AL MVP and was pretty much, not unanimously, but was thought of to be the second best player in yeah, baseball. exactly. So deals happen, and it is a team game. And sometimes the sum of many different prospects and players is greater than an individual player. And it's not like the Orioles are making these calls and saying we have to offload Cedric Mullins or John Means. Nothing from the national reporters or any reporters has given us that indication that they're the ones initiating these conversations. But because there are other players in baseball who are better than these players, the Orioles have to listen because in theory, those better players could be offered. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. I mean, look, I know I used that as an example already. I love Cedric Mullins. He is fantastic. If the Mariners offer you Julio Rodriguez, you do that deal in a second. Like, yeah, I mean, there we are can just, argue that, but... There are just some <laughs> prospects and players that you just... If somebody offers them, you can't not listen to it. Right. Uh, and due diligence does not equal want to trade or desire to trade. Right. Due diligence just means you want to make sure you know what the market is for these guys as well. Because you never know what, what could happen... You never know who could become available. If you find out what Cedric Mullins or John Means is worth to other teams around baseball, what if a superstar becomes available and Cedric Mullins has to be a piece in that trade? You know, there are all kinds of things that you have to learn. A big part of the job of GM is learning what the value and properly estimating the value of players you have in-house. You have to at least listen. Right. there, It would be more ridiculous for Michael Elias to just hang up the phone hang immediately. Hang up the phone, yeah. Also, he works with these people. He has to get other deals done with these people on right. different occasions. If if he hangs up the phone, there's no point, you know, that guy's probably not going to want to call him back and discuss another trade that yeah. the Orioles want to make with them. So let's not overreact to those kind of reports when we see them. Can we? Can we do that? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. We don't speak for Orioles Twitter when we, we say don't, that. We don't, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. One more thing I do want to touch on, Brendan, minor league coaching changes. We've seen some boosts from some guys, some promotions within the ranks, well-deserved. Buck Britton on his way up, shooting star in this organization. He has gone uh, from leading the Bowie Bay Sox team to a, um, I guess, their version of a pennant two years ago uh, to the championship series in the Eastern League back in 2019 to another very good uh, postseason year this year and a postseason berth outstanding stuff that he's done with the Bowie Bay Sox he earns a promotion up to AAA Norfolk yeah and the priority prospects in this organization right now are trending in that direction kind of along with Buck Britton I mean a lot of the top prospects in the system finished last year at AA between Grayson Rodriguez Gunnar Henderson Jordan Westberg they were all at AA Abby Rutschman finished the year at AAA and will probably start next year at AAA as well. You, you can probably make an argument that Rodriguez, Henderson, and Westberg will move up to AAA at some point next year. So Buck Britton just kind of seems to be moving along the Orioles system with their top prospects, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it makes sense as well for Kyle Moore, who also received a promotion. He takes over for Buck Britton in Double A Bowie, he goes from High A Aberdeen. Another fast riser in this organization. Back in 2019, uh, he was at Del Marva. Then he moved up to Frederick in 2020. He was supposed to be the manager of Frederick in 2020. Things got changed around, so he ended up managing High A Aberdeen this past year and did a terrific job with them there. Still a, a young coach who is energetic, has always impressed us in our conversations with him. He's on the way up as well, taking over for Buck in AA. Yeah, young coach who has, yet again, a lot of top prospects that are probably going to be making their ranks to, ranks to AA this year. Somebody like Colton Kowser will probably yeah. be on his way up there playing at AA, who Kyle Moore has already had experience with. Uh, and then one other promotion that we saw as well, Felipe Rojas Alou Jr., who was the director of the Dominican Academy uh, back, uh, I guess, in 20... Started, I think his first year there was 20. 20- 18 
when Mike Elias took over. Uh, I have spoken with him on a, a couple occasions, and he has always impressed me with his baseball knowledge. Comes obviously uh, the Alou name comes from a baseball family, very steeped in baseball knowledge. He spent a lot of times in clubhouses growing up. Very smart guy, um, and well deserved promotion for him as he goes up from the. Uh, director of the Dominican Academy to now manage low single A Delmarva. Yeah, cool to see a lot of these guys just working their way up through the organization, and it shows that being successful and having good minor league players can can help you move up. Right. Uh, yeah. It's not the promotions aren't just for the players. It's you know right. promotions from within, um, and we, you know we saw with the hitting coaches, guy gets promoted from within the Orioles system. So yep. that's that's how you want to breed talent when you're in in an organization like this, uh, in a rebuild like this, is showing that. Hard work pays off. Yeah. You will get promoted if you if you show results. Yeah, you you have talented prospects, but you also need to have the talented coaching staff that is getting the most out of those top prospects. And we've had a lot of prospects in the Orioles system over the last few years move up in prospect rankings. And obviously that is in large part attributed to their hard work, but you also have to attribute some of it to the coaches and and managers that they've had. Absolutely. All right, Brendan, we are, have to do our trade game next week we have to come hell or high water yeah we have put it off even when the orioles trade for mike trout we will still do the (laughs) trade game trade game yes uh and we will also we teased it like a month ago we have to do a trey mancini podcast at some point we'll do that things keep happening things keep happening news keeps breaking i did i don't think anybody imagined the kind of week maybe scott boris did the the kind of week scott boris definitely did did free agents have had around baseball as it has been an absolutely bonkers week around baseball. So we will have plenty more to talk about in a week. Of course, uh, follow us on all of our social media platforms. He's at Brendan Morty on Twitter. I'm at Paul Mancano. Thanks so much to Bobby Blanco for producing this episode, which you can listen to on any of your favorite podcast platforms. Like we said, watch live on Facebook and YouTube every single week. We will be back in a week with our Create a Trade game. Finally. Going to be a good time. We almost promised this time. Yep. (laughs) Can't say for certain. We'll catch you next week.